Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thanks for coming to this session with the Pearson Center. Today we're going to talk about taxes. Some of us around this table, it's our favorite topic. Not all of ours, but some of ours. <laughs> it's our favorite topic. But in particular, we're talking about that in, the, in a, a bit of a global context, actually. I think the timing for us, is, it's important for us as a Pearson Center to sort of get a much more granular about our discussions around taxation and taxation policy. And we do have the opportunity to go coast to coast to pull in all kinds of different people for their opinions so that we can cobble it together and present it to, uh, to lots of people, lots of stakeholders, those who are uh, in positions to make policy, to debate policy, and we think it's particularly useful that a third party, credible organization that is nonpartisan um, has an opportunity to talk about tax policy because these days when you read about it, it, it tends to be from a very partisan perspective. So we've got some great speakers here today who really are experts in their field. Um, a couple of board members here as well, I'm delighted to say, one of whom is a tax specialist in his own right. And uh, that's not you or me, Catherine. <laughs> but what we're going to do before we start is go around the table. I'm going to start with my right with the president of the Pearson Center. And for the sake of the two on the phone, let's just go around the, the table counterclockwise and introduce ourselves. Andrew Cardozo, president of the Pearson Center. Uh, Junaid Mirza, board member of the Pearson Center, also a transfer pricing expert at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, Heather Evans, I'm the executive director and CEO of the Canadian Tax Foundation. I'm uh, Jack Mintz, uh, President's Fellow at uh, the School of Public Policy at University of Calgary and also a National Policy Advisor for EY. Nobody uses or words anymore. Acronym. They all use acronyms. <laughs> 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 I'm Alina Patrick, I'm Welcome. Catherine Cotris, board member of the Pearson Center. Excellent. And Sandra Pupatello, and chair of the Pearson Center this year. Uh, and it, it is funny you say that, but when I was leaving politics and told people I was going to work at PwC, they said, wow, I didn't realize that you were going to move to Ottawa for public works. <laughs> and, and it's not clear that they know what the letters stand for, you know. Anyways, um, so just as uh, an opener, here's how the, the uh, oh, um, pardon me, thanks, Jack. Thank you. And the two on our telephone, can you introduce ourselves? Let's start with you, John. Sure. Jonathan Kaloff. I'm on the Board of Advisors of the Pearson Center, a co-chair Economy of Tomorrow series, but also professor at University of Ottawa. Welcome, Jonathan. We've got one more on the line. Hi there, I'm uh, Jimmy Vu, um, Department of Finance. I'm replacing Don Wilson, who couldn't be here today, uh, with a uh, the budget um, in less than a week. He, he's very disappointed he can be here, but I've assembled a, a group, uh, he's assembled a group of analysts here around the table. Uh, David Rasconesa. Um, Albert Wakari, personal income tax. Nabil Anabi. Gavin Hales. Pierre Yves Pratt. That's about it Thank, on our end. Thank you. Okay, thanks, and welcome to the analysts from the Ministry of Finance. And by the way, congratulations on an early date for your budget this year. Thank you. As a former member of, the, of a provincial legislature, I know they're, they're doing cartwheels. <laughs> they all want to know early on just how much they're getting, or if they have to start fighting with you earlier, you know. Anyway, um, so today we're going to talk about taxation policy, and the way the flow will go, Janaid is going to introduce our two guest speakers, they're going to make commentary first, then we're going to open the floor uh, to questions and have, I hope, a very good back and forth uh, around this topic. And then we are going to close right at quarter to five. Uh, that's the plan. And then we're taking copious notes uh, based on our, on our discussion, so please feel free to participate. And uh, Andrew, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the rest of us who are all volunteers at the Pearson Center. Uh, for organizing. Jonathan mentioned the Economy of Tomorrow series, which is a series that the Pearson Center has undertaken the last year and a half or so, and it really is meant to speak to uh, really the economy of tomorrow from both an economic and social perspective. And this is certainly one of those topics that fits into that lot. Uh, today we want to talk about taxation in light of what Trump has managed to do 
and although we knew what he planned to do, I don't know that all of us believed he could do it. And in fact, now that they have implemented policy, uh, my own experiences in economic development, for example, and as recently as the spring in speaking to international companies, even now that I'm in the private sector, recognizing that there has been such a long wait and see attitude with America that in my view has really impinged on their decision making in making investments in Canada. They really needed to see what was going to happen in America because it's very well known how intertwined our economies are. Now that we see what they're doing from a competitiveness perspective on corporate tax rates and personal tax rates, the questions are what's the impact on us? What should our response be? And what can we advocate, if any, uh, so that it's actually good for Canada? And I think uh, our finance minister has this as probably his biggest challenge in light of all of the discussions around NAFTA that really are, if there's, if there's a word, uh, it's going to be uncertain. And business likes certainty. So I think in this, uh, in this topic area, we've got lots that we, can, that we can talk about. So, Janaid, over to you so we can introduce our speaker. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. And they've already introduced themselves. <laughs> I won't take too long, and we'll jump right into the discussion. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, two of our leading tax experts in Canada there today with us. We have uh, Professor Jack Zitz, who is uh, a renowned expert on tax policy in Canada. Uh, we have all, I'm sure, all of us who have any interest in tax have read papers and articles written by, uh, uh, by him. He's a President's Fellow of the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary and serves on the boards of uh, Imperial Oil, Morneau Mor uh, Chappelle, and is the Chair and Vice President of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. He's also the National Policy Advisor for ENY, as he mentioned earlier. Uh, we also, and there's a lot more in terms of his accomplishments, I won't go through all of those, uh, all of the positions that he has. Um, we're also very fortunate to have with us the Executive Director and CEO of the Canadian Tax Foundation, Heather Evans. Um, CPF is an independent tax research organization, uh, which uh, you know, anyone who works in tax in Canada, you know, we, we are, we're fairly used to of getting emails from CPF and benefiting from CPS resources on a regular basis, including you know, a newsletter from Heather on a, on a, on a regular basis. Uh, before CPS, she was the uh, National Management Partner of Tax with Deloitte, where when I was at Deloitte, she was my boss at that point. Um, so without further ado, uh, we'll uh, start the discussion. Sandra, do you want to okay. kick us off? Thanks, Heather. Are you comfortable leading us off in this discussion? Sure, absolutely. I think, um, I think that um, Jack has certainly lots of, uh, lots of insights to share with us that, uh, that he'll get to in a moment. But um, <coughs> I certainly think that, you know, maybe just to, to tee up your, your presentation um, a little bit, um, when I look at the, the U.S. tax reform and the Canadian response, I'm a bit of a student of history, and it's interesting to look back to the last time there was significant U.S. tax reform, 1986. And I know you were, you were intimately involved then in some of the, the formulation of the Canadian response. And I just find it very interesting to, to contrast perhaps the response of, of the current government to what we saw then. Um, and maybe it could be that the complexity and the abruptness with which the U.S. legislation um, was passed has certainly caused the government to take additional time to reflect on it. But I do think there is um, a need to communicate a bit more than has been the case in the last few months. I think that there's a bit of an appetite to understand what the government's thinking is, perhaps some reassurance is required. Uh, I'm not suggesting that haste is necessarily the right approach in these circumstances, but there is a compelling narrative to tell about Canadian competitiveness. But for many years, we have relied upon a tax advantage that no longer exists. And so I think that there's really a, a, a twofold response that's required. One is to, to craft that narrative, which is, a, which is really a global narrative around Canadian advantages. And the other aspect of action that is required is really around tax and tax reform in Canada. And, and you know, in 1986, there was already an impetus to look at corporate tax reform. And what happened in the United States really spurred a lot of much more significant change on the corporate side on the personal side, and of course led to the eventual introduction of, of the GST. So I do think, um, and I can maybe speak to this a little bit later on, but I do think that there is really um, a compelling need to step back and determine what the Canadian path forward should look like, uh, not simply in response to what has happened in the United States, but 
perhaps as part of a greater effort to uh, to engage in, in reform of the tax system and looking at, at a variety of issues. Uh, I'm not overly optimistic as appetite to do that at this point in time. I think that um, indications have, have not suggested the government is willing to embark upon that journey. But I do think the process that was undertaken in, in 1986 that ultimately led to a white paper was a very helpful one. I think bringing together all the stakeholders to debate and discuss the issues, including the provinces, um, and talk about what a response might look like and what the what the associated challenges might be, would be a very a very useful and, and tangible um, step for a government to take. Um, I'm not, as I said, I'm not overly optimistic that um, that that is what we will see in the coming months. Certainly, probably not in the budget that's happening next week. But I think in the long run, that's probably what would be what would be healthiest uh, for Canada. And I, I'll just sort of conclude these opening remarks. I mentioned being a bit of a student of history. I went back and I. I did a little bit of research, and there was a very interesting paper that was published about the impact of 1986 tax reform on tax reform in Canada by John Boston at the University of Toronto. And um, the parallels are, are quite striking in terms of the issues that were presented by the U.S. reform back then and what the Canadian response might be and what the anxieties were amongst the business community and government. And I just found it very interesting to go back and, and read that article and reflect on the circumstances in which we find ourselves uh, today. So I'll stop there and, and certainly allow uh, you lots of time for, uh, for your remarks, John. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, just, to, just to let you know, I have had a very bad cough for the past four <laughs> weeks, and, and I don't normally cough, but when I do cough, it is a terrible spell. So I hope I don't have it in the next <laughs> uh, 10, 15 minutes, but uh, uh, I'll try not to anyway. Um, the other thing is I sent uh, Andrew... Uh, I've been writing a lot on this topic and uh, in, in the past while. Um, there's a lecture uh, or a presentation I gave at uh, EFO, which is a top think tank in Germany, on January 23rd that I sent to Andrew, and I told Andrew he can uh, distribute it to anybody who's interested in it. It's called uh, Global Implications of U.S. Tax Reform, and, uh, and so um, uh, uh, it's very much uh, focused on, on that topic. Um, however, there's, uh, Thursday there'll be a paper being released uh, by the School of Public Policy uh, on um, the 2017 tax competitiveness report, and there's a very long part on U.S. tax reform and implications. In fact, it's called, uh, uh, which is referring to 2017, the calm before the storm, uh, the storm being uh, this year. I expect 2018 we will see a lot of uh, corporate tax changes around the world. Every country is now looking at this quite seriously. <laughs> and I can tell you, uh, in not talking to Canadian, not just to Canadian businesses, but also, for example, when I was in Germany talking to a number of German large companies, uh, everybody <coughs> now is trying to figure out the implications of, of this reform and what it means to their investments in the United States and what they're going to do in the United States uh, relative to Canada. And given our exposure to the U.S., market, and I should say that there's an old adage about tax reform. In Canada, we sometimes try to shoot for the moon, but we end <laughs> up in the United States. Uh, and I think this is uh, very much where we're at right now. Now, I, I sometimes, when I look at issues, I, I like to think of, what, especially public policy issues, what's the problem? And, and then uh, talk about, is there, you know, what solutions are needed? And in the case of, uh, you know, what's the problem, let me first of all say there is some good news associated with this U.S. tax reform, uh, and that is uh, in part because it's going to be adding to the fiscal stimulus in the United States, uh, it will help it grow. But I think more important is that this U.S. reform is very much a productivity story. And when you think about it, uh, especially the expensing of capital uh, for machinery, just at the time when every board I know of, including Canada and the United States, is looking at and around the world at artificial intelligence, big data, uh, and uh, robotics, and new technologies to adopt to get down to costs and potentially disrupt competitors. Uh, this, the timing of this reform, especially on expensing, will help facilitate more quickly the adoption of new technologies in the United States, and, and that could lead to the U.S. becoming much more competitive as a result. So even though a lot of people talk about the stimulus, the fiscal stimulus and impact of growth, I think they're missing the boat. They're missing the supply side story, which is going to be the productivity impact that this reform is going to have. Now, that uh, it spells out good news for Canada in the sense that the U.S. grows faster, given we're 
you know, highly exposed in our trade to the United States, that could be a good thing for us for many Canadian businesses that sell down to the United States. But I think there are four major areas where it's going to be investment that's going to be really challenged. And right now, um, especially in a piece I'll soon have coming out, Canada's investment record has been pretty poor over the past few years especially. And, and we need to pick up on private investment. Otherwise, we will have a serious problem in terms of growth in this country uh, because investment is when people are start adopting the new technologies and, and it's also the way that you make sure that you're not consuming all your corn today, but you're, you're going to have some corn to produce tomorrow and consume at a later time, which is why you need to have investment. It's private sector investment is absolutely critical. So let me very quickly go through what I think are four major challenges for this year, U.S. reform uh, for other countries. Um, the first one is, is investment, and this is what boards are looking at right now. Should we put more dollars in the United States, or should we put it down into, into Canada? Knowing the energy sector right now in Alberta, I can tell you right now, they've already voted. Money is going into the United States <coughs> by Canadian companies. They're not investing in Alberta right now. They, in fact, the view is that they, you, we can't get oil sold out of this country. Uh, there's higher taxes, there's higher regulations. U.S. now looks extremely attractive from an investment point of view in the energy sector. I've heard some things, similar rumblings around manufacturing, especially in auto. There's a lot of pressure uh, on the primes on auto suppliers to locate more and more production down in the United States. And, and, and this reform will, will help a lot. In fact, the numbers that we do in terms of the corporate rate cut of 14 points in the United States, expensing for uh, machinery, um, and uh, is that uh, the effective tax rate will fall uh, almost by half uh, from 34.6%, this is on new investments, uh, to 18.9%. And this is assuming state income taxes stay exactly the same as they are right now. That will probably change state income taxes. State governments are already looking at how they're going to reform their system in the coming year. Some supposedly conform to the U.S. base. If they adopt some of the base broadening, of uh, um, base broadening uh, 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 provisions in the U.S. reform, uh, then they may actually cut their statutory rates as well, depending on their position vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the changes that were made. Uh, it's, it's fairly complicated what the, how, what the U.S. states are going to do. Um, so that's the first point to make, is that uh, every country in the world today, uh, and I should say every company in the world today with U.S. operations, or wanting to be in uh, the, uh, a market which is 20% of world GDP is looking very much at this reform and, and uh, looking at whether they should shift more capital expenditure, change their supply chains, putting more into the United States than what they've had before. And, and they're just figuring this out now, and we'll probably see more and more uh, yeah. uh, potential announcements in, in the near future. Uh, the second issue is financing uh, capital. Um, you know, the, from a tax planning point of view, and Heather, you'll probably agree with me on this, uh, over the years, because of the high corporate income tax rate in the United States, uh, as well as uh, the fact that U.S. multinationals had to pay tax on their dividends they brought back home, basically anyone with U.S. operations, whether it was a foreign company or a U.S. company, looked to always try to keep profits out of the United States and maybe their costs in the United States because you can get that deduction at 35% plus whatever the state income tax rate was on top of that. That's totally reversed as of January 1st. The game now will be to put more profits into the United States and potentially shift more debt, for example, to affiliates or to, uh, uh, to parents uh, outside the United States, depending on whether you're foreign or U.S. multinational. So you can see U.S. multinational they could bring back dividends now tax-free into the United States, pay down their debt, and at the same time leverage up their, their affiliates. Foreign companies will have the same incentive. Now, why is that? There's been several rules in this tax reform that's going to make it less advantageous to hold debt in the United States. One is the interest limitation of 30% of what's called adjusted profits. Before 19, uh, 2022, it's going to be EBITDA, earnings before the deduction of, of uh, amortization and depreciation and, uh, and depletion. 
uh, and then uh, after uh, 2021, okay. it'll be uh, beginning in 2022, it's supposed to be EBIT. Yeah. In other words, uh, it'll be 30% of uh, your earnings after you deduct depletion, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, there's some other adjustments too, I won't go into the details, not important. The, the main point is that uh, for companies that want to avoid getting bumping up into these tax limitations, there'll be a real incentive to try to push your debt out of the country, especially under the EBIT rule, not so much under the next several years because most companies won't be affected by the interest limitation rule in the U.S., but, uh, uh, but they will be uh, hit more hard after 2022. 20, I should say there's no safe harbor in the sense that you could be highly, not have a lot of leverage and still be hit in a downturn in the economy where you're going to all of a sudden not be able to write off your interest deductions for that year. You can carry four of them for, for indefinitely, but, but you still lose the time value of that interest deduction. So you're better off to try to shift your debt to other, other countries. And those countries that are going to attract it will be ones that are going to have, who have relatively high corporate tax rates. And I hate to tell you this, Canada, with the corporate income tax rate now close to 27%, is actually on more on the high side. In fact, most countries are now 30% or lower. Brazil's at 40. <laughs> Chad's at 40. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, please do 92 countries, by the way. <laughs> But um, but uh, uh, and Germany is a little bit on the high side. But the other thing is that a number of other countries have their own earning stripping rules and thin capitalization rules. Canada actually has pretty weak ones. And so actually, I suspect that if I was a, if, if I had some room to move debt, country will, Canada will be a very attractive place mm -hmm. to move debt. And that may be a deliberate decision, right? That is an exactly. advantage. Yeah. And so uh, Department of Finance, I'm glad you're here to hear this, but expect some erosion in your corporate tax base due to that uh, uh, because of these uh, because of that so we're going to have to look at that also the u.s is bringing in limitations on the use of losses although they got rid of the, the minimum tax uh, the, the uh, law pre 2000 or post 7 2017 losses operating losses can only be written off um, uh, up to 80 uh, up to 80 percent of their uh, of income in any year so you can't use it at the same level as you can in Canada and, mm -hmm. and other countries. So again, there'll be more incentive <coughs> to move your income abroad. A plus, the United States is bringing in what's called the base erosion and anti-avoidance tax. I won't go into all the details here, but effectively, to avoid that tax, one of the things you do is try to get your taxable income bigger in the United States of your affiliate. If you're a foreign company, have more taxable income in the United States to avoid the impact of what's called the beat the base erosion anti-avoidance tax. So those are, so this has actually significant impacts as well. So like, never mind the movement of investment and capital, but also financing uh, will also be impacted. The third uh, important change is with respect to intangible income. And uh, uh, intangible income, uh, there will be a, a tax earned by multinational, U.S. multinationals uh, on their um, accrued to intangible income, whether they bring it back to the United States or not, doesn't matter. They'll pay it on their income abroad. Um, and um, and it's a uh, it's a minimum tax. Uh, sorry, it's a tax. It's not a minimum uh, um, It's not a minimum tax. It's a tax on what they're called their global uh, income low tax, uh, sorry, their global intangible low tax income guilty. And uh, and it's defined as their kind of income net of their a 10% rate of return on their tangible assets. It effectively includes things like the return on, on research and development. Uh, it includes your marketing, intangible marketing, uh, sales, in mining, in exploration and development. They did hive off oil and gas, interestingly yeah, enough. Not, not quite sure of the logic, but mining gets included and oil and gas doesn't. Key point is that it is, the, the rule is intended to make it more difficult for U.S. multinationals to push their intellectual property outside the United States and to actually have it tax, bring it back home to be subject to taxation. And the, uh, the other one is called FIDI, Foreign Derived Intangible Income. Uh, this is a concessionary tax on holding intangible income in the United States, again defined as uh, 
income in excess of the 10% rate of return on tangible assets. And it will also, it effectively uh, gives a, a, an export subsidy uh, for, uh, for uh, in, uh, intellectual property and marketing and, and those kinds of activities where you can, you're going to pay tax at the, in the, at the beginning at only a rate of 13%, which is at the federal level, which means that if you're 27% in Canada, and you're going to be 13% federally in the United States plus whatever state income tax there, there will be on that. That will be an, another very significant incentive to have intellectual property uh, and in the United States and not holding it in Canada. It, there is a tax credit given for foreign taxes, but that would, uh, for 80% of the foreign taxes under it, which actually will claw back the value of research and development tax credits in Canada. So Ontario may find that its research and development tax system, tax credits will not be as useful under the guilty tax that, that's going to be applied. And then with the FIDI tax, it's, there'll be incentives again for uh, companies to locate their intangible income in the United States. So, so this Jack, is, could I, this is going to have another. <coughs> so I'm, I'm sure, I don't know if I didn't get that, if there are other people that need a little more explanation, because I do. So just before we move on, I just need to understand that this last point you made means that if the government chose in this legislation to tax at a much lower rate, if that's in fact a disincentive for them to move that activity elsewhere where it would be taxed at a higher rate, whatever the rate of that going country is. So if it's only 13, then they may as well do it here, which means they'll do R&D here, they'll do yeah. development for patents, et cetera, all here, or here being America, right. at a lower... Uh, right, well, it's a little more complicated because tang <coughs> if you put more tangible assets in, in abroad, you can lessen your, your guilty tax. So uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, for example, you might set up research and development abroad, <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and you might be able to get more uh, it, mm -hmm. real activities. You have to have real activities as opposed to just holding intellectual property abroad. Mm -hmm. But then you would like to hive off the tangible income and put it into the United States. And it's the old problem that we used to have with R&D in the past. In Canada, we had a very generous R&D tax credit that got lots of R&D here, but a lot of the spin-off jobs were in the United States, and this will, <laughs> this will also create more. We, we may get some R&D here, but then a lot of the a lot of the income to be generated will be done in the United States. Okay, and, and how does that ultimately there. impact on what would happen otherwise with our R&D tax credits? Because they'd still be lucrative to... Well, be, well the bigger the R&D tax credits, the lower our effective tax rate in the United States, the more likely you'll be subject to the guilty because you get a tax credit of 80% of your Canadian taxes paid. So a company that has operations right. in both countries? Right. It's not going to realize the benefit of the Canadian incentive because the U.S. tax will essentially right. offset It'll claw back the, the Canadian tax credit, right. which didn't happen before. If the U.S. company didn't bring back dividends, if it left it abroad, right. then you've got the full value of the R&D tax credit. Right. I'm just thinking of those examples where a number of our big manufacturers yep. have homes and R&D in both the U.S. and Canada, and multinationals like a Toyota, for example, with a big mm -hmm. footprint in Detroit but doing R&D here as well, now, even as a multinational, they're going to be incentivized to go full more in the U.S. and skip Canada. It may well be. Now, the U.S. is adopting, is, is eliminating expensing for R&D after 2027, I think, yeah. is it 2026, um, and going to amortization. So they're going to, you know, write it off over five years. Now, by the way, who knows what Congress will do to this package in five, <coughs> ten years. Right. And, my mind is right now let's focus on the first five years because I suspect there'll be a lot of changes before 10 years are up. Uh, right, so uh, but not everything will change. A not lot, everything will a change. A lot of these measures are temporary. So query how sticky they are. Well, the corporate ones are permanent. Right, right, yeah. right. But some of the others. The personal ones, I'm not going to talk much about the personal yeah. ones because those are all going to be phased out mostly uh, yeah. in 10 years. And they could, be, they could be made permanent by Congress before the 10-year window is up. It's just because of the... Senate budgeting rules where they have to balance after mm -hmm. 10 years, uh, called the Byrd Amendment. Right. The, uh, well, the other caveat is... But the corporate tax, the only one that's phased out is expensing. So there's five yeah. years, 100% yeah. write-off, and then 20, it'll be reduced 20% per year. Yeah. But if you look at the history of bonus depreciation in the United States, it's just bonus depreciation at 100%, although it applies to used property and mm -hmm. not just new property. 
it um, uh, the um, you look at bonus depreciation. Bonus depreciation was brought in in 2001. It was abolished at 50%. It was abolished in 2004 for three years. It was brought in in 2008 or 9 at 50%, then bumped up to 100% and brought down. It was supposed to be phased out by 2020 completely. Uh, my bet is that Congress will do something, whatever it does, in three, four years' time with expensing it. May, uh, they may not continue it for 100%, but they may. You know, they, they may not phase it out or, or do it a slower phase out or make a permanent change. Who knows what they'll do. The other aspect of these rules that's challenging right now when you drill into specific examples is that we don't have regulations yet from U.S. Treasury. And these are really complicated measures. And as soon as you start to get very specific, yeah, lots, of, very complicated. lots of issues arise and there's tremendous uncertainty. And you also need to analyze it by sector. So as Jack mentioned, like, there's, it's completely non-intuitive that oil and gas and mining would be treated so differently, but they are, right? Maybe it's a political reason, who knows? So you, it's very difficult to, once you can speak in generalities about these rules, but as soon as you go one level down, right. it, it, there's a lot of caveats that come into play. So, yeah, no, the main point is that, you know, still, these are huge, you know, it, it has created a completely different view of the U.S. in terms of yep, uh, companies and, and what they do. The other fourth change is with respect to what's called pass-through, mm -hmm. or what we call uh, Flow series. Uh, these are companies that don't pay taxes uh, themselves, but all the income is attributed to the owners. So that would be, uh, for example, uh, uh, limited liability corporations, which uh, many companies have uh, LLCs as well, uh, or limited liability partnerships. Um, and an important category is what's called subchapter S uh, corporations or S corporations, which are um, mainly you might think of the smaller businesses or, uh, of that type, uh, owned primarily by Americans. Uh, there is a concessionary rate on active business income, with, you know, not on passive income, but on active business income, and they they went to some length to hive off service income, uh, so professionals can't take advantage of it as, as much, the lower rate. But the key point is that when it comes to things like venture capital and, you know, businesses doing active business income. Uh, uh, we've already done analysis of it uh, in the past. We're just updating it now, uh, but it is now much more uh, when you take into account both corporate and personal taxes in the U.S. Uh, it is it is now much more um, a much stronger incentive now uh, tax incentive to be in the U.S. compared to Canada on the small business side, and uh, that's that's another major change. <coughs> <coughs> I'll just quickly uh, add one final thing, and that is solutions. And I won't go into a lot of depth right now, but maybe this is up for discussion. But in my view, Canada needs to think of the following. First of all, we have lost the business tax advantage that we've built up over the past 15 years. Um, and that makes any disadvantages, including our small market, uh, uh, an issue. And of course, if we lose access to the large market on trade, that could be a very serious mm -hmm. problem on, as well. Um, and, and I think you have to remember that uh, in the U.S. there's a lot of variety in state income taxes. Uh, some very important competitors are uh, state competitors have no corporate income tax. Texas, for example, uh, and Ohio. So if I was an Alberta company, I'm thinking about Texas. I'm not thinking of, of other parts of the U.S. And so the average number, state number, doesn't mean anything to me. What means a lot is 21% in Texas versus 27% in Alberta. Uh, if I was a company that is uh, in manufacturing and I'm looking at Ohio versus Ontario, well, Ohio is 21, Ontario is 26.5, so in terms of corporate income tax rates. So I think we, we have to remember there's a lot of variation in these rates, and plus the guilty uh, tax in, in the U.S., or sorry, the FITI, the foreign-derived intangible tax, the concessionary tax for intangible income will create, create some issues. Um, so that, that's one thing. My view is Canada really does need to at least have some reduction in the corporate income tax rates. My view, uh, part of it may be signaling that in this budget with a, a one-point cut uh, with potential uh, down the road depending on, on what's going to happen. Um, you know, Canada may also want to think about uh, investment tax credits for machinery. Um, uh, I don't like this policy necessarily because it creates distortions, uh, but maybe this is a time, you know, we're, we're 
you know, the government is thinking about artificial intelligence and all these new innovations, but frankly, we won't have anyone using them except American companies if we don't do something on on encouraging Canadian companies to adopt new innovations. R&D is not just a matter of creating ideas, it's also a matter of adopting new ideas. And that's, I think we have to think very much about that. And, and in the case of R&D, we may want to think again what the federal government started doing a few years ago, but should we be switching more to grants from tax credits so that we don't get clawed back by the guilty tax in, in the United States? Um, third is I, I think we do need to think about some of our base broadening uh, in the system, uh, particularly on the international side uh, as um, this potential base erosion. And uh, th fourth, I think we should really look at some of the provisions in our taxes, and this gets to general tax reform, where there are things that are not working out that well, like the Atlantic Investment Tax Credit, the labor-sponsored and venture capital credit, which I think was a huge error on the part of the federal government to reintroduce it two years ago. It was right that Ontario got rid of it. It is ineffective. It has hurt the private venture capital market. You can talk to people in venture capital industries who will tell you that. Uh, it was a very ineffective incentive uh, in encouraging venture capital. And if we want to do something, I think we need to think a little bit carefully. And certainly one of the biggest mistakes are the passive income rules under the July, um, under, under the July proposals on, on private corporations. Because a lot of venture capital was going into private equity. People who were successful sold off their businesses, put their money in private corporations, and then they're buying other corporations or funding new startups. And I, I know somebody told me in, in Waterloo, for example, the July rule on passive income has really dried up private equity for startup companies right now in, in, in Waterloo area because a lot of the people that were going to fund uh, you know, these companies are now not doing it because of these passive income rules that they're afraid of. So they're going to wait to see what the budget brings. But if the federal government makes a big mistake here, uh, I think that is going to be to the detriment of Canada in terms of venture capital. Uh, there's some other things I can go into, averaging capital gains taxes uh, and uh, mining incentives, some of them that we should get rid of, not, not a matter of bringing them in. Uh, capital gains tax rates actually I would argue are a bit too low right now in Canada, but then if we brought in averaging I think that would be a very helpful step uh, because we're now, we're at a point where, uh, where we are providing <coughs> people in risky type uh, activities because uh, because they as soon as they in that one year they sell out of the cash out and they end up being hit by the top rate one you know which now we have more progressive rate structure we have to worry about that a lot more so I think I'll stop there. Okay, very good. Thanks so much. Um, and just before we jump in, Heather, um, with more of your comment, I wanted to introduce John McKay, who's been a long-serving MP from I had to ask Scarborough Gilwood is the official name of the writing center of the universe. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, it's certainly very helpful. And I think there may have been a couple of people that joined on the phone as well. We have uh, John Callis from the University of Ottawa and an uh, advisor to the Pearson Center, as well as a group from the Ministry of Finance. Um, are there others on the phone? Okay, they might be lurking in there not wanting to stay. <laughs> anyway, John, thanks. It's great to see you here today. And I know this is extremely topical with the budget date that's now been announced for the next week or so. Um, uh, Heather, can we, uh, can we ask you to jump back in? Sure, no, I'm, I'm happy to do that, and, and thank you. Um, some very interesting and uh, always well-considered remarks, Jack, and there's certainly lots there to, to talk about. Maybe I'll just pick up on a few things. Um, you know, I talked about some of the uncertainty in relation to the U.S. proposals without regulations, the fact that some of them um, are, are um, temporary measures, but I think the general message is, is one uh, that is, I think, very positive for business. Um, and I think what's really struck me from um, the U.S. proposals uh, is that, and I've had lots of conversations with um, colleagues and contemporaries from south of the border, is that there is, notwithstanding how this played out in terms of the vote and how the law, but, you know, the, the law came to be passed, there's fairly broad bipartisan support for most aspects of this legislation. So I think a lot of Canadians think, well, coming from Donald Trump, we just have to hold our breath and eventually this too shall pass. But I think it would be false hope to assume there's going to be a major course correction, even if there's a change in U.S. government. 
I think that this signals um, a very meaningful shift in U.S. fiscal policy. And I think that, as I mentioned at the outset, I don't think Canada should or could react in haste. It's complicated. It takes time to assess this. But I think it would be a real mistake to not take the opportunity to reflect on some of the measures that Canada could take to regain our competitive position. And not just reliance on tax. I don't think a race to the bottom is the right answer. But there's a good story to tell. Uh, and it needs to be told, and the right people need to be brought together to talk about some of these issues. And it worries me that that's not happening, that we really to date all we've heard is the Prime Minister at Davos saying he's not going to produce corporate tax rates. And that, that's fine, but there has to be more to the story than that. I think there needs, as Jack said, businesses are making decisions. They already are. They're con you know, having conversations with their advisors already about relocation of operations. And it's not just a transfer pricing issue. We're talking about moving people and physical operations rather than shift, trying to shift profits to different jurisdictions. So it's, it's fundamentally a much more um, substantive exercise. So I do think that, that that narrative is really important, and it concerns me a bit that we haven't heard a lot, especially if you look at the holistic nature of the U.S. changes. And you mentioned, Jack, you weren't going to talk about personal tax. but um, you know the, the the rates in the U.S. at the personal level are depending on your state, or you know they're they're for the most part not dissimilar to Canada, but the threshold at which the highest marginal rates kick in is fundamentally different, fundamentally different. So uh, Canadians are paying tax well north of 50 percent in most provinces now at rates that are about half the highest uh, the rate at which the, the threshold at which the highest U.S. marginal rate would kick in. So that's that's a factor as well. Um, and of course, if you're looking at reducing tax rates to try and regain some competitiveness, you have to fund it from somewhere else. And I mentioned at the outset sort of the lessons from 1986 and the GST coming in. You know, I think one issue that you know you didn't touch on, Jack, but might be worth discussing a little bit is the, the relative um, mix of taxes, right? And where do consumption taxes, uh, indirect taxes like GST, come into play? And is there an opportunity to rely more on that as part of a broader um, you know, tax reduction based broadening exercise on the income tax side. I don't know what your thoughts are on, on that or if that would be politically unpalatable. But I think the government has to look at the different tools to fund some of these options if a tax reduction is. Yeah, I, d I just think it's very hard to, maybe on a personal tax you can change, but it's very hard to <laughs> say that you're raising the GST to cut taxes on corporations. Agreed. Agreed. It's so. Yeah, it is. It's an impossible sell. So. That's why I think the base broadening approach is yeah, preferable. The, the other element of uncertainty around the U.S. proposals is that it, it's maybe a bit of an esoteric point, and time will tell, but some of the U.S. provisions, especially the, um, the, the provisions that deny full foreign tax credits or effectively function, function as alternative minimum taxes, although they're not called as such, um, raise competitiveness issues with the WTO and potentially <coughs> issues with violation of the U.S.'s network of, of tra uh, treaties, global treaties. So part of the dialogue the Canadian government could be engaging in is raising some of these issues with contemporaries, so at the EU, at the OECD. Yeah. I know this dialogue is happening in Europe. Canada really hasn't been visible, and maybe it's too soon, and that's fair, but I think that that would be something that we could and should expect as well. But that will take five years to resolve. Not to start talking about it. To resolve, yes. But to start surfacing the issue. If it gets resolved. You know, because other countries have, I think, very similar concerns. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, their main uh, objection is <laughs> to the foreign-derived foreign derived intangible income concession for intangible income in the United States, which is viewed as an export mm -hmm. subsidy, and also the base erosion anti-avoidance tax. But no one's going to object to the U.S. lowering its corporate tax rate, as it's done, and no one's going to object to the U.S. adopting a dividend exemption system for multinationals, which is done by every other OECD country, and no one's going to object to their interest limitation rule, which is already done by a bunch mm -hmm. of countries mm -hmm. as well. And, and I think the U.S. Will, can argue, I think, on the base erosion <coughs> and the avoidance tax that, in principle, this is not that much different than the earnings stripping rules that have been used for interest limiting interest deductions. And uh, I think they'll have more trouble with the foreign-derived uh, <coughs> intangible income trade in which is this export looks like this export subsidy on intangible income. That has real effects. And, uh, you know, I, I already know some companies in Canada. They're looking at uh, moving their sales forces down to the United States, which was we did. They did the opposite mm -hmm. over the years because the U.S. rate was so much higher than the Canadian rate. 
I don't know if you'll remember a couple years back, it could have been more when the Americans suddenly decided to eliminate their version of the EDC, uh, Export Development USA, and they just decided they weren't going to have one anymore, and it lasted about six months. Still top mark. Pardon me? I don't think it's funded yet. It's still, they certainly re, re, uh, reversed the decision, though. So as soon as they decided they could see that their own companies now didn't have that option for use, um, it wasn't very long before they decided, okay, I guess we can't do that anymore. So I'm, I'm not sure about its funding level today. I just no, I remember think, I think it's still an issue from whether it was an issue and it was raised, and I think it was still an issue with their funding, permanent funding. Yeah, it could be that it isn't permanent or something, but it was interesting that the moment they took a big step, what they thought was perhaps, you know, savings or whatever, um, they realized a huge impact on their American companies and then they reversed the decision. And I, I think, um, you know, I was kind of hopeful, frankly, I was delighted that they were eliminating that because it was a big advantage for Canada as the EDC has become quite aggressive in a very good way globally, mm -hmm. helping American companies doing all kinds of things globally and people would be surprised how it's enhanced our supply chain activity in Canada because of what they're doing in some other country, you know. And um, anyway, so I did think that they, you know, it's a whole different group. This was under a different era in the U.S. But based on some of your commentary so far, um, in the, even if we talk about this budget coming or Heather, to your point, whether it's a proper consultation process on this topic, which hasn't happened officially from the government, even though there are people on the outside that are talking about it, do you think we're better off leaving the tax per se and speaking more to other elements of incentive for business and just leave the tax alone completely? Politically, you don't want to talk about increasing the GST. Or politically, you don't want to talk about dropping the corporate income tax rate or whatever. So is there enough meat in other activity that would ever benefit us or not? Well, just first of all, remember the, the U.S. corporate rate. Uh, actually, I was going to calculate a trade weighted corporate income tax rate in the United States. Nobody ever calculated, vis a vis Canada, no one ever calculates that. I suspect it's lower than we think. Um, but when you think of it, I do think we do need to lower corporate rates a bit uh, in reaction. Otherwise, companies will play again. Canadian system and again you know if you're you know a company in Texas Ohio or Washington state and I have a 21 percent rate or in some other states that have relatively low state level tax rate um, and I'm looking at 27 Canada even five points can make a big difference about you know transfer pricing decisions and things like that so from the point of view of protecting our own base I think we need to think a little bit about the corporate rate as well but also, I think we need to do some base broadening, uh, especially on, on protecting our tax base in Canada, as there will be this incentive to shift costs into Canada because of these other rule changes in the U.S. And one way to kind of like give something back is lower the rate a bit too, which also <laughs> helps on the base erosion side too. So that's why, you know, leaving aside the investment decision, uh, I think we need to do that. Are there other policies that we could pursue? Sorry, just don't leave no. that yet. When you talk about, uh, how would you just dis disincentivize them from moving their costs into Canada? Well, we, we I think we need tougher thin capitalization. Right now, it, it, it's easy to get around them uh, through guaranteed debt and things like that. Um, they've been tight, tightened up in the past several years, um, but I think we, we need to think a little bit more about that area. And it's going to increase it's going to make, you know, it will be a tax hike on companies if we tighten up on our interest capital, you know, on our thin capitals. Um, uh, that's one. That's one area. I think we have to look at some of the other things too. Uh, under, you know, international taxation is a very complex area uh, of taxation, and uh, you know, we may, you know, we, uh, we may want to do certain things uh, that um, you know, make sure that we do protect our tax base. But I think on debt. That's a big item uh, in my mind. <coughs> General administrative expenses, another one, transfer pricing uh, as well. But there's been, you know, there's a whole methodology for transfer pricing. It's not, you know, not as simple as one thinks to shift income, but you can do it. Um, intellectual property is an area where you can shift income very easily by licensing arrangements. This is why Singapore has a lot of pharmaceutical companies and, you know, and barbers. 
Bermuda and places like that. Insurance is also in you know, these low-tax jurisdictions. So there are things to think about, I think, that we can do. But if we do toughen up on the base side, I think the best thing is to use the revenues gain to lower corporate income tax rates in Canada, which will be consistent. <coughs> I would agree that, but with yeah. that completely, so that would be helpful. I also think there's a broader narrative, as I mentioned earlier, to talk about whether it's our immigration policy, health care, highly educated workforce, you know, the level of innovation, probably not to specialize perhaps as we might like to date. I think there is a broader story there to tell. And I think, to be totally candid, I think we've been a bit complacent for the last number of years because we have this tax advantage, right? And that was sufficiently compelling to drive a lot of investment. Because here. we're able to get the capital. That's right. You know, we can have great immigration policies, and we do have very good education systems and things like that. But we won't be able to take advantage of those things if we don't get capital. Mm -hmm. We need capital, too. And we did that with our business tax advantage we created for many years. Right. But now it's gone. That business tax advantage is now a disadvantage. So, for example, the um, accelerated <laughs> depreciation, which used to be a big um, selling feature for existing companies and where they're going to place their next investment, in, in enhanced machinery, yeah, you know, whatever. only manufacturing. <laughs> it is very narrow. We have never done that for services, and we're way off. I mean, I'll just, you know, one of the you things, we do a lot of these calculations, but I can tell you on the industry side, we still whack services, communication, transportation, much more heavily with taxes than you find in the United States. Communication is really important. I mean, we've got this, in fact, we have this kind of protected communication sector to a large degree. But uh, the U.S. reform is going to be driving the effective tax rate on communications much below the Canadian one, M even, even more so than the numbers I gave. Yeah. And in, uh, and in fact, it will be like 23% Canada, 18.5%. So, it, so do you think that that's an area to look at, which is moving that accelerated depreciation for investment in capital across more than just manufacturing? Well, the U.S. Is, does it for all machinery, for all sectors. Because if we're going to focus on AI and we purport to be interested in all of this IT, and we've got huge IT industries in, in these, well, now super clusters, super cluster of super clusters, um, that maybe that's an area to, to work on, although it's very costly to government, I would think. Well, but well, if they make the investment. But, but think of that. I mean, we, we created five super clusters at $2.4 billion, including that's both the private and the public sector contributions. $2.5 billion has a spit in the bucket compared to the total investment into the country. And so, yeah, maybe it'll create some jobs and do some thing, good things there, but uh, we have a much bigger set of issues on our hands. Yeah, I own that super cluster from fact that there are there's IT embedded in all of them and they are we have clusters, certainly right. three big ones in Ontario. But, but are we just gonna create artificial intelligence and then just sell it down to the United States and all the manufacturing jobs are in the United States and all the communication jobs are there and everything else? Is that what we're gonna do? I mean Google, sure, they're taking advantage of Canada. Our human capital, our education subsidy. I was on a panel with the with the CEO, previous CFO of Google he was going on about, oh, we need to put more money into funding university research for artificial intelligence in Montreal. He says we're, you know, we're we're uh, you know, we're hiring a lot of people in, in Montreal. You know, they're educated in Canada. I said, that's great. We should put a tax on Google hiring of ARP to help pay for that education. By the way, they end up moving people to essentially down to the United well, States. But anyway, we should get you to pay tax. Yeah. We should pay, and, and by the way, then that could fund the subsidies for Bombardier. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so this strikes <laughs> 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 my, my middle child is an engineering student at the University of Waterloo who's currently working for Google. In New York. In New York. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
I, I, my own bias is I would be a little nervous about a sector-specific response because you've got government picking winners and losers, basically, exactly. which always makes me a bit nervous. I think something that's broad-based would be would be preferable, right? And and the and the U.S. has a lot of politics behind what they've done, and a lot. Of, I mean, I'm sure you've looked at the legislation. There's a lot of results in there that are completely non-intuitive, uh, and there will be a lot of amendments in the coming years to fix many of the problems that are in there. I wouldn't suggest we want to emulate that. Yep. I, I think a broad-based approach would make a lot more sense. I would agree, and and also the other thing is that don't forget we undermine our productivity when governments start p picking losers and win you know winners versus losers because often they go to the losers because they're the ones crying the most for subsidies because they can't make it in a competitive world and then uh, and, and and in fact you know you know losers really know how to pick governments actually and so I think as I always like to say and and so I really think it's important that we take uh, try to try to keep to a policy that we've had actually since 2000 of trying to get to a, um, you know, to make sure that we have a similar tax burden on all industries and not try to favor one over the other. Uh, there is an argument to subsidizing research, providing research support because firms can't fully appropriate the returns on the research. You know, they do it themselves and it benefits other firms, but they can't capture all the, all the returns and their innovation. And that's been the argument for support of that type. Uh, but I think once you start picking sectors, that's not necessarily the best approach uh, to use. I think it's better, you know, you just never know where the technology develops and who's going to do well in the future. Uh, that's, that'll be uh, what, you know, what, what people do. So you look at the forest industry, they've been going through a lot of technological change. Oil and gas is too and things like that. We're still a resource-based economy. And so I wouldn't want to start saying, well, we're going to pick that sector and that, you know, and that sector, you know, to get benefits. I think we should take a, a, a more broad-based approach and, and that actually, I think, actually improves productivity in the economy rather than reducing it. When the Americans had a, uh, a higher uh, tax rate Well, they, a lot of them have, uh, not everything, but a lot of them have saved. So the, uh, in fact, you know, with expensing a capital, it's even more generous mm -hmm. than past bonus depreciation. So uh, that's even bigger than it was before. The other, the other thing, that we, I mean, I followed the evolution of, of the tax reform in the United States uh, for the past year very carefully. And if you look at the original house plan, they were getting rid of certain energy tax credits and all, and um, oil and gas tax credits and things like that. Senate, the Senate dropped them, actually. So a lot of stuff kind of stayed there. Um, but by the way, you have to be really careful about these effective tax rate comparisons between the United States and Canada. Over 50% of business income in the United States is in flow through or pass through. And some people were comparing taking corporate income taxes as a share of all business income, which was really not appropriate. Because if half of it is not being taxed because it's in a flow through, but, but there's much more personal taxation of it, uh, it's not really comparable. So you have to be very careful when you do that. And once you do that, it actually is, the effective rate in the U.S. actually goes up quite a bit if you just look at corporate income and, and kick out all the flow through. Flow throughs, um, you see them largely in real estate, for example. Yeah, real estate investment. Mm -hmm. with, and, and speaking of real estate, and I think you're, I, I completely agree with you that 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 hopefully we can change the narrative in Canada and not have a race to the bottom, as you said, Heather, um, especially globally, because we, you know, I mean, we still need our um, our own national industries and such, and, and employ our own across the globe. Um, but what about real estate 
for example, all of our different levels of government where, where there are different advantages to, to locate different com um, companies based on a healthy comparative advantages and create more clusters, as you were saying. We're moving from an extraction or resource-based economy into a more high-tech-oriented economy, even with bio, biotechnology, and, and we're moving into a greener economy. Um, our, um, so we, we need more local um, incentives to, to bring business, so all levels of government hopefully can work together to craft out and even select and try to retain the industries that are already here through lower um, tax rates, lower um, real estate or property taxes, those sorts of things. What about other labor incentives? We have a much more grounded and beneficial um, social program in the United States. Everything's a la carte. So um, personal tax rates are effectively higher because they do have to pay for all of their various other um, social requirements where they're met with here. So how do we, how do we graph those, um, those social attributes and with the contribution of the other levels of government to keep, and again, um, AI, artificial yeah. intelligence is so new and yet we've been, um, U of T has been heavily involved and is far ahead in their research. Where do we capitalize on that? Yeah, I mean, so you, you made a lot of very interesting points. I'll, I'll touch on the first two and leave the AI just for, for the moment. So I think that the Amazon um, situation was quite instructive. And the deal book, if you haven't looked at it, you should. It's online. Everyone can take a look at it. I think it's, it's a really compelling story about why an organization might want to locate in Toronto with contributions from all three levels of government. And it contrasts with, uh, we may not eventually be successful, in fact I suspect we won't be, it'll probably be somewhere in the U.S., but you know, th th you contrast that with the money that U.S. Um, municipalities were basically throwing at Amazon, who certainly does not need uh, corporate welfare. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's, it's just, it's very interesting to see how the three levels of government came together and highlighted all the different advantages um, that are present from carrying on business here and why it's attractive for employees to live here and all of the, all of the associated uh, advantages, economic and non-economic, financial and non-financial, that can come from operating within the, the greater Toronto area. Whether that's sufficient, Toronto, as I said, remains to be seen, but I think maybe that is a bit of a precedent for future collaboration. Canada is not a large country. Obviously, we're large geographically, but from a population and the size of our economy, we're not large. And I think we need to see more of that collaboration to be successful on the global stage, as opposed to, you know, the types of disputes that are that are happening even right now between maybe two Western provinces we won't, we won't name, but <coughs> a bit of a war over wine from what I understand. Well, <laughs> actually, I, in very, well, very well, actually, I, ship just, our I wine disagree with your comments on, on two grounds. Um, <coughs> the first ground is that, uh, you know, countries succeed in, in partly due to their comparative advantage, and resources have given us a huge comparative advantage as a country. And, and in fact, uh, you know, we're not the only ones that have succeeded uh, with that advantage. And there's nothing wrong with it. it. And there's a lot of investments in a lot of high tech and everything else in, in these industries as well. And so uh, uh, the bigger issue, though, is, is areas where we don't have comparative advantage. And I'm not sure governments should be creating one through a bunch of subsidies. I, I, I'm not sure that is actually a winning strategy in the long run. Uh, we have to create our comparative advantage by doing things well and doing it efficiently as a, as a business sector. And, and that's the challenge that the business sector has uh, in doing it. And I don't think the government should be responsible in picking which are the industries that we're going to have that comparative advantage. Um, and, and I think it's very <coughs> good. And, and to give you an example, I mean, we look at 92 countries. In fact, we do quite a bit of analysis. But, but take Sweden, for example, which does have very high uh, tax rates on personal income and labor. Um, and they also have a very strong social welfare system you know, for people. Um, but the interesting thing that Sweden does is it taxes capital at a very low level. 20, they have a corporate rate, first of all, corporate income tax rate of 22%, five points lower than ours. 
but they also have a lot of uh, a number of things that we do in their system that actually leads them to have uh, an effective tax rate on capital investments that are, are below ours uh, already. And I think that they have figured out, which is what a lot of economists often recommend, is that when you have mobile uh, bases, which is capital, those are the ones you don't tax heavily because those are the ones you need in your country too. It's your immobile basis that you can tax, tax more heavily, which tends to be labor. People don't lose that much, uh, except for your very high-skilled labor. And so, uh, so actually, the answer to the <coughs> when it comes to what is your best type of tax policy? Don't tax mobile capital or mobile factors as heavily as other factors. And that's what most countries have been doing. If you look at Sweden and all the Scandinavian countries, they've adopted dual income taxes. So the tax rate on corporate income and capital income is a lot less than on labor income. And that's that's been done there, and it's uh, it's very common now in a lot of countries to have more concessionary rates uh, towards capital because they want to make sure they get capital investment. And so we've done that too in Canada. Uh, and I think, I think you know, uh, the, the answer is not uh, in increasing our, our, you know, to making it, well, I think we still have to make sure we have a competitive tax system when it comes to capital investments and, and, uh, and in some cases skilled labor too. I think that's an issue. But, um, but I think, but that's because you're a mobile factor. But you can do that while at the same time still offering a good social policy system, which we have done in Canada, as well as uh, as making sure that we have a um, uh, you know uh, you know a system that actually uh, encourage, encourages I think the best growth possible you know for a country, and, and that's why I think policies that we adopted since the mid 90s in Canada, getting our fiscal house in order, which we've done uh, to a large extent, and and also having a more competitive tax structure. Because back in 2000, we actually had the highest tax on capital amongst all OECD countries. And we got down to the middle of the pack. But we're starting to move up. We're now out of all the OECD countries, we're about 14th uh, with the highest tax on capital. And now the U.S. has gone below us, so that makes it 13th. Highest. Sorry, not by virtue of us increasing, but by others decreasing, correct? Well, no, we went down quite a bit. We, we actually, yeah, since 2000. Back in the and it was all federal. Recently, the others are now catching up because they're now employing better tax policies or adding. Well, you know, some of these countries, tax yeah, tax. We have, we've actually had some of the most, when you add it all up over 15 years, 2000 to, well, actually to 2012, we, we had the biggest changes that occurred on the corporate tax side. It just went very slowly. <laughs> but we didn't do it like United States, one big swoop in one year. Would financial architect um, and enhanced financial architecture help with um, with capital investment? So if you had um, a harmonized um, security regulatory system that um, improves upon our our segregated all of our different um, securities commissions across the country, which you know do not have the strongest enforcement mm -hmm. in them, the greatest. Would that, would that help with capital investment? It would help a little bit, but it won't have a dramatic. It will have some effect. It will be positive, but it won't be Streamline. dramatic. Streamlining. Streamlining things. Yeah. Less I mean, there's lots of regulatory things. I mean, that was the other thing that the Trump administration has done over the past year has been deregulation. Huge amount in energy, agriculture, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, this whole thing, you know, every new regulation with a reduction of two, you know, we've actually had more reduction in regulation. But if you, but it has actually been, especially in the financial sector and in a couple of other sectors, energy, there has been uh, a significant amount of deregulation. One can get into debate whether it's good or bad, but it has happened. And if you look at what's happening in energy now, it's going gangbusters. And in fact, oil and gas, uh, oil production in the U.S. Um, has, well, this is one forecast is a little more aggressive than the International Energy Agency, but done, done by a fairly reputable group. Uh, they predicted in the next five, six years that oil production in the United States will double from 10 million barrels per day to 20. They already surpassed Saudi Arabia, no. I read recently. No, but if they go to 20, think of it. They consume 18 million barrels per day. 
So that means they're going to become a net exporter in oil within five, six years. And that, I mean, you, you touch on um, an issue as well. And deregulation yeah. is a big impact. So it's the uncertainty around regulation in Canada, I think, that is, that is the challenge. Not so much the sheer volume of regulation that could be an issue, but the uncertainty, especially in the energy sector. It's, it's businesses need to be able to make decisions, right? And that, this NAFTA uncertainty layered on top is causing a tremendous oh, amount of anger. But it's not just energy. Yet if you look at the World Bank. That's just one example. No, yeah. but if you look at the World Bank, they do a, um, a, an interesting comparison across 200, almost 200 countries, 190 countries, really. And Canada does very well in certain areas of regulation. One of them is actually we run a really good tax system in terms of compliance and administrative costs. We're one of the top 10 in the world. And I can believe that. I worked in enough countries around the world that I could tell you Canada is pretty good on the whole compared to a lot of other countries. Um, and there are areas we're pretty good, but there are certain areas we do really badly. One of them is permitting, getting a permit. And all you need to do is talk to people, urban planners, trying to get a development in the city. This was the World Bank, the, the example, not an example, the survey that we had was building a commercial warehouse. Canada, we're like 119 okay. fastest out of 180, 190 our countries. Our productivity and our net GDP. Yeah, so if you want to know, getting goods to Tidewater, way slow. Slower than the U.S., slower than, way slower than Australia. We're way slower than Australia on permitting. Getting a contract written, very slow. So, you know, there's certain, actually it was very interesting because they go through a whole bunch of things. Some things we do really well on, but... There's some things, especially around what I would call infrastructure, we do badly. We do very poorly. Has our, has our immigration process improved compared to the U.S.? Oh, we, we've had a much better immigration poli policy because it's been less family-based and more on merit, <laughs> which is really what the Trump administration is arguing for right now, which he would make it more clear. <coughs> exactly. Although oh, well, he did at one point think he wanted a Canadian-style system. I think no, no, but actually it even came out lately. lately. They mm -hmm. said it, but it doesn't. I wish he could say uh, it. Could I jump in and ask if Jimmy or John or anyone in Jimmy's group has a question for our speakers? Yeah, actually, Jonathan here. I, one of the things I appreciated from uh, Jack from what you were talking about is I'll call it pragmatic tax policy, meaning what are companies actually doing, not at the theoretical level. So you've painted a bad picture in terms of the investment flow from Alberta, but what I haven't heard from you is what are you picking up in terms of what foreign governments are going to be doing in their tax policy in, resp in response to the United States? So what are we responding to? Um, so far, they're, they're kind of looking at it. Uh, uh, I don't know what the Germans will do. Uh, the, um, you know, they're going through right now uh, the difficulty of even forming the governments, <laughs> <Yeah>. <coughs> and so there's, uh, you know, it, it's not entirely clear uh, what they're going to do so far, but also they're not as exposed to the U.S. as we are, uh, right. uh, you know, in terms of, um, of, uh, you know, their operations and things like that. <laughs> uh, the in in the work that I've done, uh, probably the countries that are uh, going to be most concerned are going to be the ones that tend to tax capital pretty highly. Uh, so I got a communication just yesterday from India uh, where uh, the Indian government is definitely looking at this uh, in terms of how they should respond uh, because they have pretty high effective tax rates on capital, even even with the significant uh, uh, value-added tax reform they just recently did, uh, which was very, uh, very positive, actually, on capital investments. Uh, but they still have a lot of other things in their system uh, that uh, lead them to be actually one of the highest in the world. The Latin American countries are going to be very sensitive as well to this because of their exposure to the U.S. Uh, as well. I haven't heard yet what they're thinking of. I think part of it is that a lot of businesses are just starting to mull over exactly what they're going to do in response. And because of the, as Heather said, the tax reform was so fast that people weren't sure it was going to happen or not. Uh, that uh, that uh, and it's complicated uh, that they're just sorting it out now. So I had, for example, I, I had a uh, meeting with um, one of the major companies in Calgary uh, two weeks ago because I was there, and uh, and uh, uh, they are certainly looking at what they should do vis-a-vis investments versus Canada and U.S. Um, 
but they're also looking at some of the provisions that uh, they need to plan around now, uh, particularly the base erosion uh, and anti-avoidance tax, the BEAT, uh, is one that they're, uh, they were quite concerned about. Uh, but this will depend. I, I met a, a company in Montreal uh, that isn't worried at all about the U.S. reform. Why? Because they don't have that much uh, exposure to the U.S., and so they're not too worried about it. And in fact, they don't have many operations in the United States, so they were concerned. On, just on that point, uh, Jonathan, I was going to tell you my own experiences uh, on a public board that I'm on with our debate at the table around securing our, our sort of hedging our bets and making sure that we have an alternative plan for our production out of Mexico, that it can move easily into the U.S., um, that we ha we're doubling up on what our plan would be for transporting of these goods. So a lot of the detail and the NAFTA discussion is very pertinent to, to this company. And the other side of it is, speaking to some of these American business people who are involved in our board, some of the work we're doing is just to make sure we don't get in their crosshairs. What can we do that's really good as a Canadian company in the U.S. so they'll leave us alone, mm -hmm. uh, basically, and make some decisions, which we've since done, and you know, making investments in the U.S. that I can't say for sure they would have been in Canada, but we would have had a fighting chance. But otherwise, it's really the time to show some investment in the U.S., so they can fly it up the flagpole if they need to. And that is strictly a business decision, even though it's emotional-based versus fiscal, which is really interesting, you know, for a bunch of Canadians who are doing business in the U.S. Right. This, this is an important discussion because, you know, Andrew can tell you that many years ago we set up an early warning system for the government to the Alliance of Sector Councils where we said, what are your uh, companies actually doing now in the recession? So we were the early warning system, and you know, Jack uh, is, is somebody that foreign governments and companies are going to approach and say, this is what we're thinking of, and perhaps as Pearson, we need to think about that sort of an early warning system where we use our network to let the government know what the talk is at the board level and at the foreign government level, because we can't be reactive. We can't keep responding, and we'll be in trouble because in a speech I gave to the EX group, I said... Uh, Capital moves quickly, not like it did in the past, and foreign governments will take advantage of weaknesses that they see in a very quick basis. So, Jack, I appreciated your comments, and uh, Sandra as well. And Andrew, I think we need to start looking at how we tap into this on a proactive basis. Okay. Uh, Jimmy on the line, anyone from your group have a question? Uh, no, we're, we're good here in the department. Thank you. Okay. Are you enjoying the discussion, Jimmy? Uh, very much so. Thank you so much for uh, inviting us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. We're all smiling over here. Um, can I ask, okay, I don't want to jump in if there are others that uh, please do just jump in. In your opinion, how would you rank tax policy as, say, the top five reasons for investment, for foreign investment? So if you're an international company and you're looking like Amazon may have, although their list, I think, had other things on it that weren't... Uh, necessarily items on a balance sheet. Um, where would you place tax policy? Okay. I don't. Yes, I, automatic I don't question, question to ask. Is what else is there a, on the list? It's a wrong question to ask because there's many things that determine an investment and ranking one thing over the other. It all depends on the situation of the company and things like that. But what we do know from economic studies, and a huge number of them, the taxes do matter to a certain extent. So if you're talking about right now in Canada, uh, just trying to remember what our total private sector investment is, uh, let's say 500 billion, and and if you raise taxes a little bit, maybe it wouldn't have that much of an impact. But if you raise, or if you have a major change, like we're going through right now with the U.S. change, um, uh, but if you have a major change, then uh, you know, that's going to have a significant impact, even if it means, uh, you know, a loss of only $25 million over $500 billion, but still, uh, you know, a fairly important loss. Uh, now, the number I usually use is that uh, for every 10% um, uh, increase in the cost of capital, I'm not saying 10 percentage points, but 10%, so let's say, you know, uh, 5 to 5.5%, uh, the loss in capital stock is roughly 7%, which is a large number. It's, it is a relatively large number. 
It's not a big elasticity, as economists would define, <coughs> but it's still pretty significant because you also have to remember that that's going to have important ramifications for the economy because uh, the, our ability to pay workers higher wages depends on productivity of capital investment. And in fact, that's that's always been the biggest issue, is that a significant part of the cap taxes on capital end up, uh, especially the corporate income tax, end up getting shifted back onto the immobile factors of the economy, which is labor. Well, and I guess I'm saying that I reckon, I think that our trade agreements have a, are going to have a larger, there's a, a bigger risk for us right now than a discussion about tax policy. Uh, yeah. Right? And, and I say that based on, so I don't all, know. most of our companies are all in the southern part of the country, right across the country. <coughs> they all largely, all loosely used, do business with the U.S. mostly, 75% to 80, right, depending on the sector. And this, you know, I, I, I was on this investment tour in India, four cities, Every single city with a different group of business people, every single question uh, session began with what's going on in the U.S., followed by I think we better wait to see what we're going to do because our pitch has always been yep. come to Canada as your gateway to the U.S. because people come where they have customers. So, so this so is what worries it's me. Instant, yeah. But that's this why is what worries me the most. We've had a, a strategy in Canada when you go back to free trade uh, and tax reforms around then, regulatory reforms, privatization, things like that, where first of all, we would make it more attractive for people to invest in Canada. But, and, and so we did the GST and we did, you know, uh, you know, provinces have dropped into the HST to a large extent, uh, at least most of Canada. <laughs> and, and, um, and we've done a number of deregulations that I think have been pretty good. And so we've made it more attractive, but at the same time, we've had free trade that gives access to the U.S. market. So it was a twin strategy in my view. This is being upended this year, mm -hmm. where we're losing the business. We're losing some of our advantages. We still have advantage on, I would say, the workforce and education, but we don't have an advantage on capital anymore, on attractiveness for capital investment. Mm -hmm. And if anything, right now, the signal about Canada, and I've been hearing this from investor presentations in the U.S., not just in energy, but also manufacturing and others, People are starting to look at Canada's high tax, high regulatory costs. Why? Because governments are signaling that right now. Ra you know, toughening up in regulations, raising taxes. And the, better, doing. the private corporations rhetoric feeds into that as well. Exactly. And the private corporation rhetoric did not help at all. No. But the view it, but this is investors, foreign investors in the United States looking at Canada and they say, you guys look more politically risky now. We're less interested in you. And I'm sure that's, you know, some of the other countries around the world are starting to look at Canada that way too. Now with this U.S. tax reform, U.S. now is more attractive from a tax advantage. It is on the regulatory side more advantage in, in a number of areas, not in all, a number of areas. And, uh, and uh, what they don't, they have a large pool of labor. I don't think their human capital is as good as ours from a, you know, from a per capita point of view. Our base is higher. But they have a big population. But let's face it, they also have a big market. If you're in the United States, you have 350 million people. And even though there's some regulatory differences across the states, as we know, it doesn't matter. It's easier. Once you're in the United States, it's easier to deal with all the states and try to do it from Canada. And so we have these disadvantages. And I think now that we've lost that business tax advantage, all these other things get more exposed. And, I, and some of them you can't overcome the market. And NAFTA, if it falls apart, that raises the wall even further mm -hmm. in terms of getting into the United States. So can I ask then on a positive note, all of the, all the things we, the things that really are still our competitive advantage from either a tax perspective or other. You know, we mentioned in passing immigration, you know, to the extent that that matters, a skilled workforce, I guess I'm assuming that when we say immigration, we actually mean skilled workforce or one that's coming in now already educated that we don't even have the cost of educating them, which is a, like a bonus, right? So let's say skilled workforce, and for some sectors that matters. Um, I, I just, and, and I know, Heather, you've mentioned a couple times that this, the narrative isn't wide enough. It's always, you know, come to Canada, you can, well, you're not coming for the weather, so. You're coming for something, and it's going to be, we all say, and I have heard this recently, 
I try not to get my back up. And they say, come for the educated workforce, as if we're the only country now that has an educated workforce. And that just isn't true. There are other places that have nicer weather that have very good education. And I can't believe how much weather plays a part in where people want to live. <laughs> but it's hard older I get. <laughs> I'm having to face There's a reason why you get the United States of 350 or 35 million. <laughs> they're mostly more south than we are. <laughs> I know. Well, and I've also, I will always joke, you know, but I come from Windsor. We are 800 kilometers south of Vancouver in my hometown. <coughs> and it makes a difference. So at least four weeks of fabulous weather more. So in February, you know, I think of that. But in any event, um, all to say, what are those positives, in your opinion, where we're still hanging on, maybe gripping with our fingertips, where maybe a little more bolstering in this area, given new new focus in in technologies, AI, you know, whatever the, all these, you know. But everybody's things. doing that. That's a problem. I get that. So where yeah. is ours? You know. Oh, well, that's why it goes back to comparative advantage. I hate to say it. Resources is one area we have very significant comparative advantage. Right, and since 1917, and, and we're saying, you know, we're starting to hurt ourselves on that through our own yeah. Going, so going to the issue of the comparative advantages, the U.S. has basically bought down the tax rate. It's just fiscal insanity. Because their their deficits are are massively mm -hmm. out of control. They just Keep on adding to the debt. Keep on adding to the debt. At, at this point, the conversation is not um, is out of control. But point, presumably, among reasonable economists, the, the concerns are starting to uh, to rise. And I would have thought that Canada's relatively fiscal sane, fiscally sane situation should, in the, maybe not the immediate term, but the Shorter term, a short term, start to play somewhat to our advantage. I haven't heard any conversation about the U.S. fiscal insanity, the continuous run up to the edge of the cliff, etc. I think the U.S. the deficit issue in the U.S. I think is more than the tax issue. So on the on the, I didn't talk about this, but on the uh, tax side, uh, first of all, the Joint Committee on Taxation, which used a pretty, uh, I would say, conservative focus uh, estimate suggested that uh, we you know you have to remember that there was a rate cut but there was a lot of base broadening too under the US reform so you know it didn't go the whole way it did a million uh, trillion and a half over 10 years uh, balances at the end because of the Senate rule um, so it would add by 2027 20, uh, it'll add uh, under the Joint Committee of Taxation estimates it would uh, in terms of impact on extra growth which they do in the U.S. They do dynamic scoring. Uh, that instead of a 1.5 trillion dollar cost, it'll be about a trillion. Um, it'll add. Uh, that will be. You can expect the U.S. GDP to be around 28 trillion by that point. Uh, so under their estimates, so then you're talking about roughly a three percent add onto the debt GDP ratio, not the deficit, but the debt, the debt GDP ratio. Um, now, now, if there's better growth. And so, for example, uh, a colleague of mine at Boston University he runs a uh, fairly sophisticated model internationally, Larry Koplikoff, who has 17 regions. And, and the trouble with the Joint Committee on Taxation, they have more of a closed economy approach. So they don't take into account international factors as much. And also the fact it may actually drive lower taxes in other countries on capital. Um, but he doesn't have, Larry doesn't have reactions of other countries either. Uh, but if you uh, if you take Larry's uh, argument, he says that in, over the next 10 decade, you're going to have an increase in household income per capita of $3,500 in this tax form. This is in, due to growth. Uh, skilled wages will go up about 6.8 percent. Unskilled wages about 5.2 percent. This is in total over over 10 years. Uh, but his estimates is that the impact in terms of the actual cost of the U.S. tax reform will be almost negligible under his model. So it all depends on the all attributed to growth. So they sort of because because he has a higher growth factor than the JC than the Joint Committee on Taxation. So it really all comes down to like how much impact do you think will have on growth? Budget office by that no, no. I mean they we've had back and forth with them actually because I've been involved a little bit on that, uh, but. Um, uh, no, because they use the closed economy. They have a different model. <laughs> so 
so they say, you know, we're more conservative. You know, economists are pretty bad at, at, at the supply side stuff. And I think one of the supply side stuff is animal spirits. And, and the thing about this U, U, U.S. tax reform, the personal tax stuff is really unimportant. I don't think it's going to contribute to more growth and do that much, actually, on the personal tax side. Uh, where I think the big, the big changes is on the corporate tax side. And I think that's where you're going to see this, uh, I, I think, important benefit. Now, the question is, will it lead to the U.S. having a 0.2 percentage point increase in growth rates, which is not insignificant on the longer-term basis, uh, or will it be 0.5, you know, or 0.4? makes a big difference to your revenue for it. And what does their growth rate need to be for that fellow's modeling to work? Uh, his growth rate, I can't remember. No, I don't have it in front of me. Three, something No, he didn't have three. It wasn't that high. He had a, it was higher than the JCT, but it was not as, you know, like by another 0.2 percentage point. I think you said 6 percent over 10 years for the personal Income tax. So well, that was on wages, so skilled wages. But let's say on personal income, 3,500 would be, uh, right now. yeah, approximately about six percent, I think. And so, over no. ten years, so you're not talking, you're not talking about three percent, you know, the percentage point in per right. year. It, it won't be that. So could, could I go back and ask you again? I keep just Andrew's telling me that we're almost out of time. I can't believe it's here. Oh. I don't really want to let you go, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Where would where would you say then our best strengths are in in foreign direct uh, investment or in you know expansion for our local companies? Where is the best advantage for Canada? I know well, I've always taken the sector. You said okay, again. Is the benefit, I, I, mean, I don't like governments. I mean, I kind of like yeah, Heather. I don't like governments picking the sectors that are going to win I didn't and say the types sector. of technologies. So, and, and, and their compared advantage. I think my view is you try to have a, a set of policies, and I think we've been doing this over the past 20 years, a set of policies that are, that kind of make, that try, you know, that encourage, that allows more growth, but it's people figuring out for themselves where best to grow. That's why, for example, I'm a great believer in a carbon tax or cap and trade system with a uniform price on carbon, and then letting people figure out how to reduce carbon. What I don't like are all these implicit carbon prices right now through regulations like renewable standards and ethanol requirements and this and that. Because if we really, you know, if we, if we had taken more of a hands-off approach, I have seen scenarios of getting down to low carbon that could be established in all sorts of different ways. And it's all a matter of which technologies win in the end. But we can't predict that. But people who make the investments, and eventually, they'll, if they have the incentive, they'll do it. So that's why, I've always, oh, that's, why that's an example. But if we had taken more of a hands-off approach on carbon pricing and saying, okay, we're going to have a uniform price, and we'll let people figure out how to get around it and, and adopt the technologies to reduce carbon, I think we would have been a lot better off than what we're doing right now. Okay, not and it's a good example. Not answering my question about oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't so, because I don't think yeah, it's. So if you were to say education is probably Canada's best strength because we've got yep. more per capita in terms of that's a very high-end policy. school. That's a general policy. But not one that the federal government <coughs> has a lot of influence in. Correct. They do Correct. fund, but they fund sort of but that's after the fact. Different. They've not, you know, that's definitely energy. Different. They don't have a mm -hmm. national energy grid, for example. So you have this very inequitable method of energy and pricing across the country, which can't be helpful to business citizens, right? And you would think as an energy-rich country, we'd have figured that out a long no, but time that, ago, that's but we haven't. I mean, but those are more general so, policies. So, but, yeah. but if the federal government's role is in a more generic cross-country, then where can they pick a spot to do better in than they're currently doing so that it actually is something they can focus on? If we're not going to win on tax cuts, which we won't, because if they're determined in the U.S., we want to be the lowest. Well, we've never chased to the lowest here. In Canada, no, but I think right? you should distinguish between tax cuts for capital versus tax cuts for labor. Okay, you know, I have to tell you, things. as having been in government, well, two different things. you look at what you're looking ahead to as a government, you need to know where's your revenue coming from. 
The CIT was the most unreliable number ever. You never knew how much you were getting. Mm -hmm. It could be off by billions. We used to help Ontario with the forecast. So you knew that, right? So, right. And then all of a sudden we have, oh my God, we got all this money in this year. Why? Well, we have no idea why. Every company made their decision that no, year to write off point, this, but not that. No, no, but my point is... So the, the CIT, from a governmental perspective on how much money they'll get and therefore what they can do with it, it's actually quite unreliable. No, but let me go back to tax structure matters. So, you know, this is a general policy. So, again, let me go back to the Scandinavian countries. Scandinavian countries have taken an attitude that we can afford our social policy and the kind of society we want and the kind of and they have high levels of taxes. Sweden's at sixty percent of GDP. Mm -hmm. But the one area they don't pose high taxes is on capital. I get that. However, they have not changed because that they figured that out. In my entire lifetime that's never changed. So they've never had to go from high corporate to, uh, to high personal. They've always been high personal for my yeah, entire but we lowered life. our corporate rates in Canada. You see my point though, it's a different political game to have to go from 50% to 60%. No, but all I'm saying is not what they've done. In my, ge in my entire policies, generation, they've never had to do that. One of the policies is to improve the tax structure. One of the policies. Yes, education could be good. I'm glad we do what we do. You know, our, our immigration policies, as long as we keep the merit-based approach, I think is good. But we have to ask, like, there's a lot of things we do well in Canada. We're not going to do, we're not going to be able to create that much more demand than what we're doing now. Yes, we can run things a little bit better. But, you know, we've had a low productivity growth for a very long time in this country. Mm -hmm. And we haven't yet found the solution about why, with how we could pick it up. We're not doing what Israel does with 2 to 3 percent growth rates in, in productivity. The United States have traditionally had 2 percent. They've been mm -hmm. down to 1 percent. My bet is I could see them going up to 2 percent right. uh, or 1 and a half percent in the, in the next decade. But, 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 we, but co productivity is something that we... You have to really work on through a number of policies, including regulatory policies and education and tax and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you now, some of the things we do in the tax system does not help with productivity. You know, especially throwing incentives at, at, uh, at uh, you know, at inefficient incentives at, at economic activities that don't need to get that kind of reward. Yeah, you did mention that earlier on about looking at the, the tax codes and actually looking at what actually does not work and get rid of them. I don't know that there's been that kind of an exercise because you never really see um, how, who takes advantage of these tax credits anyway and was it always what the government expected? Well, there's oh, well look what we've done on small review. business. There's tax expenditure we've, review. We've just made the situation even worse with even a lower tax on small business yeah. active business income. and created a bigger differential. And, that, and, and yet you've had a lot of economic studies that have shown that actually they encourage the small businesses to stay small. It hurts their productivity. There's no gain to doing that. There was a tax expenditure review that was done. The problem <coughs> is the big ticket items are all the, the sacred cow, right? So there's some nibbling around the edges in the yeah. last budget, but there wasn't really meaningful progress against. But it was also an exercise to raise taxes, not, to, this true. not to cut the rates. Yeah. But it also examined the effectiveness of some of those expenditures, or lack thereof. See, I don't want to just, you know, if you just raise tax levels, then you're not going to help, especially in today's world. Mm -hmm. uh, is that base broadening? What do you mean by that? Cutting back some of the incentives in the areas. So exactly, we did that kind of calculation on accelerated depreciation and, you know, certain tax credits. We, we found that you could lower the corporate tax rate without hurting government revenues, not taking into account any growth factors, it was just a static estimate. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you, could, you could get the corporate rate down to 23% percent again, at the general rate. With the same revenue. With the same revenue. By reducing... Eliminating, ca yeah, eliminating certain, uh, certain incentives in the system, accelerated depreciation. And do you think that any of Small business tax, the small business deduction. Do you think this was a big item, actually. Would any of the states take up the room that the, Amer that the feds are giving them? On tax? They might. Uh, we'll have to see. It'll be interesting to see what they do this coming year. Of course, the U.S. psychology is very different than Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, the state level taxes are very high. You know, 
in the U.S. don't. Depends you know? on the state. They're deductible. It's on the states, but they're deductible. So you can make you a very specific list of the states we compare. No, on. no, no. But if you calculate the corporate income, I'm not talking about the personal. I'm talking about state tax. Yeah, I'm talking about state. So if you look at the right now or in 2017, the federal corporate income tax rate was 35 percent. The state level governments added another 4.5. In Canada, our federal rate is 15. The provincial governments have another almost 12 points. No, I'm aware of that, but yeah. states do differ. No, they do differ, but not. But it's all deductible. So the top corporate rate in the U.S. I think is Iowa is around 11.88, or I forget the number. You know, let's say 12 percent or whatever it is. And then you got five states, six states at zero, and mm -hmm. uh, and then you got a whole bunch that are well below five, and they're deductible from the federal one. But the average state level tax in the United States is seven percent. GDP weighted. GDP weighted. GDP weighted. One of the arguments that hasn't been put forward is again the advantage or disadvantage of what the government should react, shouldn't react, is um, how should you say the um, ill guided attempt to achieve some some greater level of income equality, uh, which I think was behind the uh, initiatives in the summer. Um, Google Analytics will tell you if you want to live the American dream, move to Canada um, because you have a much greater chance of moving out of the lower quartiles and moving into the higher quartiles here than you do in the U.S. almost twice the chance. So, um, I, you know, so as I think about your, your argument that uh, it leading to a kind of a conclusion that we have to, we have to respond to this initiative by the administration, um, I'm wondering how uh, I'm wondering how the attempt, how ever crude, of uh, part of the current government's effort to make incomes more equal, less disparate, shall mm -hmm. we say, maybe this is, it, um, is in fact um, creates a social harmony which uh, does not exist in the in the U.S., which mm -hmm is not insignificant. I, I think you raise a really important point. I was actually um, uh, discussing this exact point with someone last week, and, um, and Jack, you'll correct me, I'm sure, if I'm, if I'm misstating this. This gentleman was an economist, and, and he would posit that the levels of income inequality in the United States are actually a huge drag on their economic performance and would offset a lot of the competitive advantage that lower tax rates might seek to achieve. And I, again, I'm not an economist. I can't comment on that. If you could suggest the literature would support that assertion. But I think that intuitively many of us as Canadians are very uncomfortable with the level of income equality that we see in our southern neighbors and a lot of the social problems that stem from that and, um, and would be loath to replicate that yeah. type of social structure in our own country. And that's one of those factors that I think is, is hard to measure. Correct me if I'm wrong, perhaps economists can measure, but I do think it factors into the mix as to where uh, organizations choose to invest. And I, in my previous life, was around many tables assisting clients with making those types of decisions. And Sandra, you know, tax is always on that list. It's not at the top of the list, it's not at the bottom of the list, it's, a, it's definitely a factor. But some of these intangible elements are given a lot of weight as well, particularly when you need to relocate employees, right? If you're talking about a highly talented, skilled workforce that you may not be able to replicate in a new jurisdiction. So I, I do think you raise an important point, and I do think that that's part of the, the story that needs to be told that really I don't think all of these different threads are being pulled together right now in a way that is compelling because we've been able to simply rely upon our tax advantage for a long time. Yeah. But as that has fallen off, the other factors you know, may have remained static except for perhaps trade uncertainty which has deteriorated a bit. Those factors that need to be brought to the fore. So again, going, going back to, to <laughs> an important issue though, it's, it's, it's one thing to talk about taxation inequality you know, social, you know, social uh, policy that we have in the country, uh, and, uh, and and what's conditioned on that. And I think that's very much a personal tax issue, and sales tax and other types of taxes that individuals pay. The bigger question is, in the end, who pays for the corporate tax? In other words, is a corporate tax 
part of a progressive tax system or not. And what a lot of economic analysis would suggest today is that corporate taxes tend to end up getting shifted back onto labor and actually end up being regressive, especially on, on large companies, not small companies. Because small companies, people could, high income people could shelter their tax in a small company. But when you're talking about big multinationals, that actually you get, you put more taxes on them, you actually hurt the population, not a lower income population because it will end up getting passed through with higher consumer prices or lower negotiated wages with immobile labor in that country. And that's what a whole bunch of studies have shown, including some Canadian studies. And so I think, again, if you're trying to address the inequality issue in corporate taxes, I think there's not much evidence that would support that that's the best way to go in to try to get. Your argument would be lower corporate taxes uh, actually increase more social equality. I guess that's possible, true. right? That's how to say an indirect benefit. Right. I mean, it's more complicated because of sure is. Yeah. low, you know, when you have it's personal income hard. tax, you can undermine the personal income tax because right. <laughs> you need a corporate tax to make sure that people pay their tax. But, but, but when you're talking about multinational investments and large corporate investments, you can argue that putting taxes on them actually is regressive, not, not progressive. Speaking about base broadening, do you think that there's a lot to be said for an underground economy in Canada that we have yet to capture and get them paying their taxes? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's been various estimates done on the underground economy, you know, some using what's called a monetary approach to get a much higher number of the share of GDP uh, than others. Um, and we do know that in certain areas like construction and you know, there is a lot more tax evasion that goes on, uh, not just vis-a-vis -vis the uh, GST or the HST, but also the income tax, which is usually the big one for, the, uh, for people to avoid. And, uh, you know, can we address that? Well, again, yeah, that's an argument, actually, for lower, trying to keep some of the rates lower as and, and bases broader so that you do a better job capturing the rate, because when you start pushing rates really high, that encourages people to try to avoid taxes more. Well, when I see sort of a CRA focus on the tips for waitresses, for example, yeah. I I don't know if those people should pay taxes on tips. I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that business people who don't pay taxes, I get really mad at them for what I know I pay. So there is even a more sympathetic, sympathetic response from the public to get everyone to pay taxes, never mind... Yeah, who we now need to decide whether we're going to tax their tips. There is that. So politically, it's a better bet to go after tax evaders. Whether that's, a, you know, many more inspectors on the streets from the CRA, I don't think that's positive. But I don't know that they've ever figured out how because I think governments yeah. always speak to it. They always say, oh, and we're going to capture, you know, the 5% that slip away. But we never really do. They're, well, they're becoming uh, a lot more sophisticated in their methodology. Yeah. The but I also argue that the more complicated, or but the yeah. more complicated we make our tax system, you know, with a lot of special provisions, this and that, special incentives and things uh -huh. like that, actually the more it encourages tax evasion. That's why I used to tell governments around the world, you know, that you're actually making your problem worse because you end up you're losing this revenue here, you end up bumping up the rates here. You're making things very complicated for administrators. They have to spend more time trying to say, you know, like what's a, you know, uh, you know, like uh, like the food exemption under the GST. You know, mm -hmm. what is necessary food, what's not necessary food. I mean, mm -hmm. You're ending up spending time on this sort of stuff. And, I, I, we're moving to. And then people start <laughs> trying to avoid these taxes because because the auditors get so busy trying to deal with all these different margins. Okay, I guess I did think that over time the automation of the CRA versus their clients, you know, the more we automate, the more onus that could help. They, they've become much more sophisticated in terms of auditing, especially for non-compliant behavior, using sources of information outside of the tax return filing process. Correct. Right, so for example, FinTrack data, you know, catching transfers of funds coming from overseas over a certain threshold, land transfer tax, uh, information subject to provincial privacy requirements, which are problematic in some provinces, including Ontario. Uh, those types of tools they have not used in the past. 
social media. Just They're all in yeah. yeah. Well, there's there's a, a very much and big data is being used in a much more sophisticated way by the tax authorities around the world. And, and global mail investigations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So did they ever name the three in the Panama Papers? Did they ever say who they were? I don't they just know. Said they were gonna. You know, I, I got a funny story about the Panama Papers. So the company I was once associated with, and, it was, uh, and they were listed in the Panama Papers because I saw the list. So I phoned them up and I said, you know, were you guys, you know, running things? So he said, somebody must have used our name because it wasn't us. Really? Oh, yeah. so identity theft. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, or that's a really good answer. <laughs> <laughs> or that was a really good answer. No, no, I think they, uh, <laughs> We were never <coughs> anything through Panama. Wow. Yep, they were they were on the list. They were on the list. Wow. Well, okay, President, I know we've all shot our time, but the two of you are really very, very interesting and thoughtful. Yeah. And uh, for our sake, it, it, it's really good for us sort of get our some wind behind beneath our sails here too in, in this discussion because we do uh, constantly marry this discussion around social benefit and economic benefit. Uh, around our discussions, but I think that's uh, it's never just a pure tax discussion. It's always um, what the cost of that is and, and that sort of thing. So I, I would like to thank you both. I think officially you have Janae thanking our speakers. Stop. Oh, is that okay? Well, that's the plan. Go yes. for it. I thought that's Andrew that's Andrew was thanking them, but that's well, always. Okay. I <laughs> know. Uh, so thank you both of you. This was this was an, it was uh, a really engaged engaging discussion, and I personally took a lot out of that. And I, I've been spending the last uh, uh, eight or ten weeks actually looking through the U.S. tax reform and uh, the various uh, proposals even before that as well. Um, so, you know, what I think has been lacking a fair bit in the discussions that I've been part of before is what should the Canadian response be? And um, you know, it was uh, the proposals or the ideas that you have put forth today. Um, uh, there, there's there's a lot there for us to go back and think about, and uh, hopefully we'll come up with a uh, with a paper on that that we'll share with you um, uh, as well. And as Pearson Center, a big piece of what we are focused on is actually coming up with uh, the pragmatic, practical policy uh, ideas that we can share with um, both of our elected officials as well as bureaucrats uh, to guide the discussion in. Um, or to lead the discussion that actually results in then policy changes. Andrew, I don't know if you want to add to that. You just took all thoughts out of my head. This <laughs> okay. is a great piece. <laughs> no, that, that, that's really helpful to, to figuring out what, what we do next. And I think I, I, I'm quite interested that you that you're not you're concerned about it, but not panicked and don't think everything should be or will be in the budget next week, unless John knows differently than <laughs> us. But I mean, I think you I think you're saying. Uh, there's a story we've got to be told, and the solutions are a bit more complex and long-term, but we've got to get to them. We can't waste too much time. <coughs> That's fair. So thanks very much for that, and thanks for everyone here and uh, on the phone.